hold on to power or investment in public services, which the polls show most people want. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt has been dropping more hints that tax cuts are what we should expect, and he might pay for them by cutting spending. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, has got fresh data from our voters panel, the people who voted Conservative in 2019, which helps explain why. And all this is happening as the former London minister, Paul Scully, announces he's standing down as an MP at the next election, saying the party is fuelled by division and has lost its way. He'll join us live. That's next. Also tonight, George Galloway arrives in Parliament and is sworn in as an MP. He tells me he's not a one-man band. And the other developing story, the government's Rwanda bill is back in the Lords and it's not going well. The largest defeat that he's suffered there since he became Prime Minister. And as the investigation into how Russia eavesdropped on a German military conference call continues, we'll look back at previous security breaches. All that and more with Ben Bradshaw and James Starkey, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Monday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Good evening, and welcome to The Politics Hub, and welcome to Budget Week, a week of endless speculation and then endless analysis. A week of rabbits, hats, red boxes and red books, where Paul Johnson and Torsten Bell are celebrities and everyone's waiting for the big moment at the OBR press conference. The expectation is that Jeremy Hunt will cut taxes on Wednesday and we'll be talking more on the programme about what we think will happen. But I've got another prediction for you today. On Wednesday afternoon, or maybe on Thursday morning, once the dust has settled a bit, a bit we'll have a much better idea about when the election will be. Think about it. If this really is the last budget, the last big fiscal event before a spring general election, then it's one of the last levers the government can pull. So we should expect a blockbuster budget with policies they hope could swing an election. If the PM is planning on hanging on until autumn or even winter, then other things could then come into play. Economic credibility, fiscal responsibility, leaving some cash in the bank to fund a pre-election giveaway. You see, there's so much speculation in Westminster about when the election will be, but really no one knows. On Wednesday, we'll get some cold, hard facts, some important intelligence to feed back for analysis. It's not an exact science, but I reckon that by the end of the week, we will have a better idea, spring or autumn. And if you promise not to hold me to it, I'll let you know my thoughts then. Well, last week on the programme, we launched our voters panel, a project with the pollsters YouGov, where we get the views of people who voted Conservative at the last election. And we've gone back to them ahead of the budget to hear their priorities. Here's our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates. I would like to see something that would save Great. me some Never in doubt. more money staying in our pockets. I want a cut in tax, or NI, or both. These are the voters the Tories want and need to win back. This online community voted Conservative in 2019, now telling Sky News what they want from the budget. So many demands, but one big problem. We have no money, so I'm not really sure that Jeremy Hunt can do very much at all. The Chancellor may need to manufacture a miracle, and even that won't satisfy everyone making a pre-budget visit to a factory with a clear message, don't expect too much. So we do want to move to a lower taxed economy, but we're only going to do so in a way that is responsible um, and recognises that uh, there are things that taxes pay for, uh, that we couldn't cut taxes by borrowing. Uh, we'll do so in a responsible way. Uh, but if we can spend money on public services more efficiently, then uh, that will mean less pressure on taxpayers. It must yeah. be quite emotional well, for you. Yeah. This could be the last chance for the Prime Minister to dig his party out of its political hole. So there will be some tax cuts coming on Wednesday, likely to national insurance, and rows in government over whether to cut public spending to pay that bill. Bingo. Drilling down, Labour knows there's no money to spend. They're focused now on reform, a tough new stance designed to get more young people working. We will invest in you and help you build a better future with all the chances and choices this brings. 
But in return for these new opportunities, you will have a responsibility to take them up. Under our Change Labour Party, if you can work, there'll be no option of a life on benefits. Both parties talking up tough choices. Now, the people in the building behind me know that Wednesday's budget needs to be a game changer. Yet, Jeremy Hunt is proposing tax cuts when polls suggest that a majority of the public want public spending increases. Why? Well, Sky News voter panel explains. It's a group of 2019 Tory voters, many of whom have now abandoned the party. But amongst that group, a majority want tax cuts. And when pushed, more say that they want tax cuts over spending rises by a ratio of three to two. The Tories are listening to these voters. I'm sick of paying the government all my wages. It's ridiculous. All they do is waste my money. Throwing more and more money into the public sector won't improve the services. It would just encourage even more um, more wastes. I think income tax needs to have a cut to it because middle earners are being dragged into that higher tax bracket. Last autumn, Jeremy Hunt's big gamble didn't move people like this. This week, can he win them back without pushing the rest of the country away? Well, our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, joins us now. Sam, at this point, I feel like some of our viewers will be kind of shouting at the TV screen, public services are creaking, debt sky high, why on earth is the government talking about tax cuts? Um, and quite possibly a majority of the public do think that, the polls suggest, as we were saying just there. I think there are a couple of key reasons why the government is likely to do what it's about to do. I mean, the first is a practical one, Sophie. If the Chancellor stands up and announces tax cuts and they're implemented within weeks, then voters probably will notice that. But if the Chancellor stands up and announces a hypothetical path of increased public spending over the next five years, they're probably not going to notice that before the ballot box, uh, before they go to the ballot box. But there's another reason. It's to do with the voters that we were looking at in the voters' panel. There is a core group that the Tories want more than anything to try and reunite, which is Boris Johnson's coalition. And at the moment, tax cuts, they hope, will bind some of them back in. Look at Rob from Chichester. He's one of our panel. I think both parties just seem to offer more of the same. More tax, low growth, no long-term plan, don't see a future, which is why people like me who have always voted Conservative are now seriously considering, uh, you know, new alternatives like the Reform Party. It's that Reform Party again, isn't it? And Sam, you know, how much agreement is there you know, around the Cabinet table amongst Conservative MPs that this is the right path? So I think that there is... There are quite a lot of MPs who are quite happy to keep a lid or even lower future public spending, particularly if it means tax cuts, particularly if it mean, that means some of them saving their seats. But it's, it's not a done deal. Um, I think that there is even some disagreement at the top. Jeremy Hunt has some red lines in this area. He might be prepared to, you know, cut theoretical future budgets that, you know, where you don't actually have to work out the savings. But he'll be very nervous about actually doing something that harms public services further. This is the subject of the row. Will there be public spending reductions on the le less growth in public service spending in the years to come after this budget or not? This is the biggest live debate of the budget. We'll have to see on Wednesday. Uh, we certainly will. Uh, lots uh, of coverage there on Wednesday as well. Sam, thank you very much indeed. Well, one person I'm interested to get the thoughts on that debate uh, is the uh, MP and the former London minister, Paul Scully, who today became the 59th Conservative MP to announce he's standing down at the next election. Now, Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt may want to restore the Conservatives' reputation as a tax-cutting party, but Mr Scully says that the party has lost its way. Let's get a bit more uh, from uh, him now. Thank you for being with us. Pleasure. Firstly, why have you decided to stand down? Look, for me, uh, I have loved doing what I'm doing, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult at the moment, and I think my seat is eminently winnable, but... MPs have a five-year notice period, effectively, and I don't want to sign up for another five years. I'm not going to be part of the long-term solution of regaining that focus long-term, and so it's better to stand aside and let someone else um, step in and do that. I mean, some people might say it's not eminently winnable. It's got a bit of a fight on your hands. Is that oh, yeah. Well, I, look, I've always treated it as a marginal seat. I mean, it was you guys actually wrote me off in 2015. I remember <laughs> uh, Joey Jones at the time. I remember Joey down, Jones. Coming yeah. down <laughs> and said, no chance having to do it. But so, so you have to treat it as a marginal. I've always done that. That's why I'm eminently winnable, not definitely winnable. There's a big difference there. Let's talk about 
the debate we were just discussing there at the top of the programme, um, you know, the budget, because you tweeted to say this, you said, <laughs> fuelled by division, the party's lost its way and needs to get a clear focus, which I hope the budget can start to provide. Yeah, it's, a st it's got to be a signal. You've got to tell a story. It's got to have a, a, some aspiration behind it. We can't always be in crisis management. We've had really difficult years. Every government that um, uh, around the world has had, uh, uh, you know, difficulties around COVID, around uh, the war in Ukraine, You're not we don't have to give them no, that. No, no, sorry, but I mean, but, it, but it's important because actually what I'm saying is that so lots of governments have been, uh, you know, wrestling with the same problems we have, but the problem, but you, we're always looking in uh, and we're forgetting that actually people will judge us on the election, not just for what we're doing, but they want to know, what about housing? What about me as a younger person? Not me personally, obviously, uh, as a younger person, what chance do I have? So you've got to be aspirational. You've got to tell a story, a narrative about why we're doing what we're doing, not just crisis management. So with the budget specifically, if, if there is this row about whether tax cuts are the right thing to do, if it means a reduction in growth for public services, where do you fall on that? So I think it's right for the Chancellor and the signals that I've been getting from him that actually we should be signalling that we uh, that we are want to cut taxes where we can um, and that reminding people that we are, uh, in general, a low-tax party, things are difficult as it is. I would look at things like tax thresholds. Again, it's telling a story because otherwise you can sit there, you can't bribe people clearly uh, just ahead of election, say, here's a big tax cut, here you go. And that's why I think things like inheritance tax mm. uh, is a bit of a red herring because uh, although it is a pernicious tax, I would get rid of it, but not now. Not now. Things like tax thresholds, because actually you've got nurses, you've got teachers, public servants that are being dragged into high rate that should never have been there. That was the high rate tax was never designed for them. It was designed for people that were, for those public servants who seemed out of reach their earnings. It's those kind of people that we should need to be speaking to. Are you worried about spending on public services as well? I think we always are. I mean, you know, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I see local authorities around the country uh, that are struggling, and at the moment it's it's more prevalent that uh, it's the worst the ones that are badly run uh, and the ones that are struggling to run those competently that are falling by the wayside. But I was local government minister for a while and I see what's going to happen in years come, uh, to come if we don't start to correct that. So there's plenty of other things we need to do around public spending. But at the moment, I think just signalling that we're a low tax party and there will be more to come as the econo economy improves, then I think that's right. You want your party to focus, you say, on a wider portion of the electorate, you talked there about young people, for example, and I just want to read your tweet from earlier. You said, if we just focus on the core vote, eventually that core shrinks to nothing. The standard deviation model is true in politics. Most people are in the middle. We can work with the bell curve or become the bell ends. We need to make that decision. So you're saying the Conservatives are at risk of becoming the bell ends. That's what you're saying? Yeah, basically. Um, look, you, you can sit there. Uh, battle of ideas is great. But if you just have a, a shove, an ideolog ideological shove to the right, for example, then just mathematically you can't win an election. There's not enough people in that corner to actually win an election. You have to. What they in. might be saying, though, I guess, is look, we're not going to win the election. That ship sailed. We're just trying to shore up as much of the core so vote as possible. So what you do? So what? Yeah, but that's that, again, the core vote will die off or move away anyway. So you start in the middle. You, if I'm in the swimming pool and I'm trying to get people to come in, I'm not going to sit there in the deep end and say, "Come and join me." You still in the shallow end, in the middle ground or something like that, and say, let me explain why you should come with me. The water's warm over there. Let's go together on that journey. Now, you've had a bit of a bruising time recently, I think it's fair to say, right? Uh, you faced some criticism when you said parts of Tower Hamlets and Birmingham Sparkle are no-go areas. And then you, were, you said you were the subject of a bit of a pile uh, as a result of that, rather than people asking, what did you mean by that? So I want to ask you, what did you mean by that? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, last time I did your show, Sophie, it was a little while ago, and we talked about the casual racism that I faced yeah. as, uh, uh, as a mixed-race uh, youngster. Um, and so it's been really frustrating and, uh, and slightly disheartening. But it's, you know, it's partly my own fault because I used a, a phrase that actually means a different thing to I meant, uh, that I meant to other people. I talked about the fact that prejudice and the sort of words that we heard from Lee Anderson last week uh, we're hearing from other people, occur not in a vacuum. It's when people build up their prejudices, sometimes because they feel uncomfortable because of the actions of a minority. It might be a black gang, it might be a white gang. If you're a Muslim walking into an area, it might be a Jewish person walking into an area. It could be a gay person holding hands in a particular area. They sometimes judge a majority 
based on the actions of a minority. And they write off communities as a result of that. And that's where words of division start to come in. So you're wrong then to say, you know, Tower Hamlets is a no-go area. Right? Yeah, what I meant no-go, I mean, that means you can't go there. I mean, that's what I meant, yeah, true. exactly. And what I meant was that people are choosing not to go there or they felt uncomfortable about going there. But, but as I say, people use that phrase as a con- a, with a different connotation to the one that I glibly made and unfortunately made. And you, you know, you, we have spoken before, as you said, about casual racism that you've experienced growing up. Are you worried that, you know, comments like calling parts of the UK no-go areas, that plays into that casual racism? Well, as I say, look, I, as I say, I used the wrong, the, the wrong phrase. I should have talked about how um, people are uncomfortable using that. But what's been interesting, uh, you, you write that, you know, that if I hadn't apologised, I hope that mm-hmm. goes some way. But the fact is that so many people ignore that, forget about that, and they've just kept on saying, tell you what, why, why don't we take you to Tower Hamlets? Why don't we take you to Birmingham, into these so-called no-go areas, and speak to people there? Well, by definition, they are uh, already in those no-go areas. Why don't we speak, actually, more informed, uh, informative, speak to other people about why they may feel uncomfortable? Let's tackle those prejudices and get their understanding from them, and then maybe we can change their minds through better education and understanding. Uh, finally... What are you going to do when you step down? Oh, How are you going knows. to fill your time? Learn no. to play the piano, travel the world, you're going to earn loads of money? What, what, what's the plan? Look, I can already play the piano. I've already been, uh, you know, travelled to many places as MP. I've been really fortunate in that way. I've clearly got to pay the bills, so I've got to find a job. I don't have a plan just yet, but I've been speaking to a few people. Let's see what pans out. OK, thank you very much. Good to have you on the programme today. Paul Scully there. Well, that debate that we've been having on the programme this evening about tax cuts in this week's budget, tax cuts or spending cuts, uh, is sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll be taking a first look at the front pages in our press preview and news review, that's with Anna Botting, from 10.30 this evening. So join us tonight as we discuss tomorrow's biggest stories with The Sun's chief political correspondent, Jack Elson, and the political editor at The Guardian, that's Pippa Creer. Well, listening to that interview with the outgoing Conservative MP, Paul Scully, is the Deputy Chair of the Conservative Party, that's James Daly. Good to have you on the programme. Thank you. Uh, there. I mean, lots of people say Paul's completely right. You know, if, you, if you're going to win an election, you have to be in the middle of the bell curve, you have to be in the middle of the swimming, swimming pool, not kind of drowning in the deep end. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is that Paul Scully's a great man. He's, he's somebody who I know very well. I hope he considers me a friend, because I would consider him a friend. And I think that any politician who's motivated by the right principles, however they are described, sometimes, so when we talk about right, left, up, down, which, whichever, I think we miss the point. What we are acting upon is the concerns of our constituents and what we perceive to be the wider interests of the country. So I think this idea of let's just talk about the centre or let's just talk about this or let's just talk about that, the idea is to have policies in place which answer the concerns, so whichever view of politics you have. I didn't feel like he was talking about, you know, the centre as such, more just like appealing to a wide range of people. Because you, you can see, and you know, we'll be looking at it with a bit with our voters panel, it can feel like the Conservatives are focusing on a very small, narrow coalition of voters who voted for Boris Johnson in 2019, and they are the guys that they need to try and get to turn out. And effectively, you know, OK, if you're a young voter, well, you're not going to vote Tory anyway, so let's not bother with you. Well, if I could give, it, give an example. So I was a councillor in Bury before I became the MP for Bury North. I've been there for about a decade now. I campaigned all throughout the north of England, all throughout the Midlands. I was one of those politicians who went everywhere and did that. The biggest issue by a million miles on the doorstep, up until the point in 2019 and after, was immigration. And the people who I was speaking to on the doorstep wanted politicians to have a robust policy in respect of immigration. Now, some people would say, well, that's a a sort of right of centre thing. That's a a thing that we perhaps shouldn't be talking about in in the terms that the debate is at this moment in time. But I think it's more important to be honest about what is making people tick. What is the concerns that they want addressed? And that's why I support this Prime Minister in terms of the Rwanda policy and other immigration policies to address that. But that's not right wing, that's just acting upon the concerns of constituents throughout the country. Let's talk about the budget, shall we? Of course, yeah. there's a big, big debate going on right now about whether now is the right time for tax cuts, particularly if that means less spending on public services. What do you think? Well, the, the Chancellor will always act responsibly in respect of that. I'm a, well, let me tell you my view. My view is that I think we should cut taxes, and there's a debate as to where that should happen. We are the Conservative Party. I came into politics because I believed in cutting taxes. I believe that individuals are better at spending their own money than the government. I think what the Chancellor's also been saying, which not, I don't think you discussed with Paul, is the... We can always discuss... I mean, you know this, Sophie, in Parliament. We can discuss 
you know, politics and figures. I could quote 50 billion to you in this, 20 billion. The question is what we do with that, how that money is used, how it's used efficiently to get the best bang for the buck for constituents. Now, that's not often discussed, is it? And I think that's what the Chancellor is going to... Well, one of the things the Chancellor is going to concentrate. We can't just simply talk all the time about pound signs. We have to relate pound signs to outcomes. You say that people are always better at spending money than the government. And I get what you're saying, but is that always true? I mean, you know, the I, government I, spends money on things like roads, on things like schools, yeah. on things like healthcare. And we're the best one in the world. No, but what, that's, that's the kind of point. No, but the, the point that I'm making is that we're always going to spend those, that, you know, no matter which political persuasion you come from, we're going to spend, thankfully, you know, we, we're, as a government, we're spending. The debate, but the we're spending. We spend on that, that spending, is where the debate is. We're isn't spending it? record Are monies. We're spending enough on We're spending services. records amounts of monies on the NHS, on, on um, the police, on other very important public services. And what I'm saying is outside of those important safety nets, making sure that our roads are not, you know, that we are, we're tackling potholes, other things that strike people people in the face when they're going out of there. After that, surely it's not outrageous to say, I want people to have more money in their pocket to make their own decisions in terms of what they want to spend it on. I don't want politicians spending that money for them. OK, uh, just finally, because we've got uh, Daniel Kobedi of the National Education Union on later. And I know that you did hit the headlines uh, with an interview with an eye uh, recently, or not that recently, a few months ago. <laughs> uh, you said most of the children who struggle in Bury are the products of, I'm not even sure if I can say this on TV, um, of crap parents. And so what do we do to try and address that issue? Apologies uh, if I uh, have uh, well, <laughs> can some I, offensive language. Can there. I put this in context? Yes, this was, this this was, is, this is the this idea. Was, this, this was an interview that uh, um, the report from the eye came up to Bury were in a very nice cafe in Berry, which I would recommend, okay. and it took the best part of an hour to have this interview. And the lady asked me what motivated me, and I said what motivated me was that I'd been a governor at Hoyle Nursery School in my constituency for well over a decade. I wanted to come into politics, and I thought it's something to offer to ensure that those from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, you know, to make sure they have the chance to thrive and succeed. We then got into conversation where it was suggested, well, basically, everything is the fault of the government. That if you, you know, on an educational journey, this has nothing to do with, with, with children who perhaps um, have got, or on the, you know, this would just, I think it's important to say this wasn't about kids who maybe have autism or have got mm. challenges in their life. This was just about kids on their educational journey. And I said, and I know it might be outrageous to your listeners, that individual parental responsibility is just as important as what the state does in providing education. Now, if, an, if a politician cannot say that individual parental responsibility in supporting their child through their educational journey is not a good thing, then we are in a really, a really strange place, aren't we? And so, you know, perhaps... You know, in a, you know, perhaps I would use a different word, having my time again in respect of that, but I ain't going to apologise for what, doing what I think is right. My whole political journey is about trying to give people opportunity. And, you know, I was a criminal solicitor in Bury for the best part of 20 years. You know, I, I've represented everybody with every challenge that they are going to have in terms of their home life and everything else like that. And so okay. it's very important that we concentrate on that. And these topics are not off kilter. No, they're talk not. About, That's Sophie, why we're we should, talking about it. Sophie, Absolutely we should talk agree. about that. The, the government is not responsible for everything. Everything. Parents and the responsibility they have for their kids is a massive part of outcomes and successes for young people. Uh, absolutely no topic like that off kilter here. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed. James Daly uh, there. Right, let's bring you up to date, shall we, with what has been going on in the House of Lords because people peers have, have been voting tonight on a bumper set of to amendments to the Rwanda Bill. A total of 50 were put forward by members of the House of Lords and it is having an extremely bumpy ride. There's been five votes and, get this, out of five votes, there have been five defeats for the government. So pretty clear there that Rishi Sunak is having probably the most difficult time that he's had uh, in the House of Lords trying to get that Rwanda bill through. In many ways, not a big surprise uh, that that should happen. Well, we're joined by our chief political correspondent, John Craig, who has the latest. John, how difficult has it been? These are the biggest rebellions uh, that, uh, and biggest government defeats for, since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister. The significance, I think, tonight is the scale of these defeats. Now, the first two... Um, the first, there have been five votes already tonight. Uh, they're continuing on Wednesday. First vote, majority of 102 against the government. Second vote, majority of 102 again. Third vote, majority of 110. Then it slumped to 87, and the last one it was... Uh, and then it was uh, uh, a majority of 91 against the government. So big majorities against the government. Uh, the biggest since 
How about this for a bit of a parliamentary oh. trivia? <laughs> um, like. The Duke of Wellington had an amendment to the government's environment bill Amazing. in 2021. Um, that was on uh, pumping sewage into rivers. Uh, the Duke of Wellington, was it uh, Boris Johnson's Waterloo? Anyway, the, what's significant <laughs> also is the revenge of John Major's cabinet because the rebels tonight have been Ken Clark, John Gummer, Douglas Hogg, and another one, uh, uh, Lord Tugendhat, that's Tom Tugendhat's uncle, and a 92-year-old hereditary peer called Lord Eccles, who I must admit I'm not sure I've heard of before. But what's going to happen now is more votes on Wednesday. The, goes, the bill then goes back to the Commons on Monday, the 18th of uh, March, back to the Lords for the ping-pong we all love so much on the 19th of March. The government will hope to get it through by Easter and get those flights going. But uh, what they're debating at the moment, actually, you just saw Baroness Lawler. Uh, she's a Tory right-winger, I think we can safely call her that, aided by uh, Lord Frost. Um, and they've got an amendment which basically says, Minister, ignore uh, every uh, international Australia, convention you've ever heard of and every piece of human rights legislation. EU-derived law, nah, don't want that. <laughs> All that sort of stuff. That will not get through. That's Baroness Lawler there. You can't quite see David Frost, Lord Frost there, but I assure you he is there. Um, um, but it's absolutely huge defeats for the government tonight. Thank you. And uh, more to come on Wednesday. Yeah, certainly will be. John, thank you very much for keeping us up to speed with what's happening in the House of Lords. Right, let's bring in a duo for this evening, shall we? The former Labour Cabinet Minister, Ben Bradshaw, and the former Home Office Special Advisor, James Starkey. I feel like we should talk about the budget. It's a big theme of the week, isn't it? We, we, we can feel this, I guess, the grappling going on between protecting public spending and also, of course, the tax cuts. Ben, where do you think the Chancellor should go? Well, I, it's very difficult because the economy is in a really bad shape. There's not really room for tax cuts. He'll want to give his Tory right and, and some of the people you saw in your earlier mm. focus group uh, who uh, uh, say that's their priority, although as you also rightly point out, the polls mm. show the majority of people, you know, are worried about the health service, the collapse of local government, policing, all of our public services which mm. are on their knees. Uh, but I don't really think it, it t terribly matters because whatever happens is going to be small. It's all going to be about the election. It's all going to be about trying to set traps for Labour mm. because, of course, if they mm. do X, what are we going to do? Are we going to match it? Are we going to reverse it? And it's not, it not, won't really signify. I think what really matters is the outcome of the election. I just wish we'd had an election sooner rather than later so we can get on and make some long-term decisions rather than these political kind of gimmicks. Yeah, it does feel like it's been a very political uh, budget mm. indeed. James, where do you fall down on the kind of debate about whether now is the time for tax cuts? <clears throat> I think, well, as ben, ben rightly said, everything... We're in an election year. Everything is about... I was talking about to someone about this today. And they said, oh, do you think this is within an eye to the election? I was like, literally everything that both parties do this year is with an eye to the election. Mm -hmm. And as Ben touched on as well, one of the problems with that is it doesn't necessarily, for me, the party, lead to great long-term decisions. So we're having a debate uh, about, you know, what is it going to be na national insurance or income mm -hmm. tax? And, you know, are they going to look at the non-DOM policy, which Labour put forward and maybe adopt that to raise some revenue? Uh, but one of the biggest problems, which was mentioned on those kind of vox pops focus groups that you had, is that fiscal drag we've seen mm. of the income tax brackets. Mm. Long term, that's got to change. It's dragging in kind of teachers and nurses, and that, that's not what it's designed mm. to do. So long term, that's, got, that's what's got to change. There's not the money to do that now. And I don't think it's going to happen now. Mm. And also growth and productivity. Nothing, I mean, that's what we really need decisions on. Long-term decisions for growth and productivity because that's how you pay for better public services and reduce the tax burden. You talked earlier about um, traps for Labour. And it does feel that, doesn't it, right? Because the decisions of this budget are going to impact tax cuts that Labour can either keep or scrap if it wins yep. the election and also the kind of projected public spending plans, many of which people feel, some people feel, are a complete fantasy. What should Labour do? Because it feels like Labour's taken the decision to say we're going to try and stick as closely to the Conservative plans as possible to not frighten the horses before an mm. election. Is that the right thing? I think thing? depending on what uh, the government does in terms of tax cuts, 
uh, Labour should say either that, yes, we think yeah. that's a good thing, because if it's a tax cut for working people and the working yeah. people have got the highest tax burden they've ever had, if it's something that we wouldn't have done, then I think we should have said that wouldn't have been our priority, but, mm -hmm. of course, we can't make any commitments until we've seen the books. Yeah. But we've been... I think Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer have been very clever at not falling into any of these Tory mm. tax spending mm. traps up until now, mm. and I don't think you're going to see that changing before right. the general election. <laughs> Um, at the beginning of the programme, I said that we're going to have a big hint about when the next election is going to be, right? Because if it's going to be a big blockbuster budget, mm. then that will be like, hang on, are they kind of trying to get everyone excited to have a May election? Sam's been like, OK, I'm going to hold you to this. Thursday morning, I'm going to ask you what your prediction is. So in the interest of gathering all the intelligence possible <laughs> from people who I think are vaguely plugged into this, when do you think the election's going to be changed? Well, I was listening to Sam's great <laughs> podcast, um, and they seem to hedge and say, oh, there's reasons yeah. to say it could be not. They, they can't have that as a prediction, by the it's way. It's not a prediction, a is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, I've, got, I've always had a nagging feeling they might go May. Really? Mm. And, and, but if I look at ev all this, all, everything available, the polling in particular, it says to me, wait, it will more likely wait to the end of the year. So I'm just going to go with the consensus, okay. which is easier in saying... November or January, yeah. I'm afraid that's always been my view mm. and it remains my view. Very yeah, nice. You'll scare people with January if you think we're going to... I'll ask you, I'll ask you both after Wednesday just to <laughs> check that that's still the prediction. Thanks both very much indeed. Uh, ben Bradshaw, James Starkey. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. George Galloway is sworn in as the new MP for Rochdale and he has a message for his fellow parliamentarians. Would she like to be back? Well, I'll tell you once I've been inside. The I always loved the building, the people in it, not quite so much. Today is all about the economy. The Chancellor could be a real game changer in the general election. It will be the pre election fireworks. Big set piece event of Budget Day, of course. Whether it will be enough is the big question. Some may soon be promised a little more money in their pocket as we head towards the election. But will these budget giveaways be enough to gain your vote? Full coverage on Sky News. I'm Stuart Ramsey and I'm Sky's chief correspondent. Well, there's a real sense now that people are beginning to expect that this whole airlift is coming to an end and they're really, really desperate. We saw snatch squads going in, grabbing people and putting them into trucks. You either live and recover or you die. OK, so that's like a war. That's the war, yes. Yeah. We help you understand the world with us. Over the past 24 hours, the soldiers have been attacked on a number of occasions. It's really sending a clear message that Venezuela is eager for change. We've been crushed. To take you to the heart of stories that shape our world. They were convinced the United States would become hooked. Well, we're right. An enormous explosion has just come down. I think it was a monster that just landed in between us. The information on this could bring down the entire network, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the world. It's not out of control, but the big withdrawn. It's so, so hot.
Hello, welcome back. Well, the Prime Minister said on Friday that George Galloway's by-election win in Rochdale was beyond alarming and represents a threat to democracy. Well, here he is, being sworn in to Parliament. He was accompanied by the father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley, and the Albert MP, Neil Hanvey. Afterwards, there was a bit of a media scrum. I was there and I put this question to him. Some people are saying that, look, you're a one-man band. Uh, yes, you did very well in the by-election, but that was a by-election where you were basically in a two-horse race and the other person tripped over their own feet with the Labour Party. What difference can you actually make, given that you may be chucked out of office at the next election? Well, I've assembled quite a good audience for a one-man band. Uh, and I suspect, you, I suspect you know that I'm not a one-man band. I suspect that you know that I'm emblematic of a much larger band than a one-man band. And it was never a two-horse race. The Conservatives and the Labour Party were both crushed in this by-election, which not one person has asked me about so far, but is the most significant thing. Well, let's bring in uh, Ben Bradshaw and James Starkey, uh, shall we? I mean, he was scathing about the both Labour and the Conservatives, saying that he there were, it was a pathetic result for him in Rochdale, that it was a seismic win for him. I mean, how much do you think we should read into it? In the individual result, I mean, um, I think I mean it will bring the debate. It will change the debate. He's he's clearly going to capture media mm. attention on a regular basis. It's what he's good at, mm. and so you're not going to be able to escape that, that debate. And both parties are going to have to deal with that. We saw the speech, speech, speech from the Prime Minister and Keir will have to deal with that as well. How much... I th this one-man band aspect, he's already said, you know, people can set up under his umbrella, but they won't get funding. Whether, whether it will really impact a wider vote is, is going to be hard to tell. I don't think mm. he or a party of his... Whether there's some unhappiness on the issues he's played into, and will that feed into the election? It's hard to tell right now. Mm. What do you think? Well, I mean, you said Labour will crush. We didn't have a candidate. That's why we were crushed. <laughs> we had had a candidate. I think we probably would have won that by election. But I agree with Jamie. I think the, the worry I have is that Galloway will simply add to the general toxicity yeah. of this debate that is going on in this country at the moment um, and drag it even further into the mire uh, where it is. And that's why I could not understand Rishi Sunak making that ridiculous statement in Parliament, drawing attention to it. There's nothing Galloway likes more than attention. And if you'll watch how Labour MPs and Keir react to him, I think they will, they will do their utmost to ignore him because he craves attention and that's all he lives on. Yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? There was, I mean, it was a, a, big, a big, decent old crowd uh, of reporters outside <coughs> Parliament and you could tell that he was certainly giving us the time. Everyone got to ask a question, I should say. Um, do you I think... think um, are you worried about how he's going to influence the debate then? I think in Rishi's defence, I would say this. Whatever happened at the end of last week, Galloway was going to dominate debate across the weekend. And I think the two main party leaders have got to meet him head-on to a degree. And they've got to take, take on some of his arguments and debunk them. You, you don't agree, Ben? No, I mean, I've been around a bit longer. I've had my own run-ins with George Galloway in the past. I was even <clears throat> uh, made to apologise. It's one of the decisions I regret more than any other by the Labour chief whip for saying that he was a... Um, a mouthpiece for, for uh, Saddam Hussein, which, of course, you'll remember he was. Um, and I think the best, the best tactic is to completely ignore him, I honestly do, for the best, for the good of our politics and for the good of one, one's own sanity. I mean, the fact that you were made to apologise for saying the remark that you just That was while again. he was still a Labour MP, so <laughs> okay. there, were, there were party okay. management issues involved, but very soon after that he was expelled from the Labour Party or left of his own accord, I can't remember. Um, but, no, I mean, I think if, Sunak, if, if Rishi Sunak had been more experienced and hadn't been... I think there were other motivations, this is why he made that statement. But if he'd, he'd been, if he'd, if he'd been more experienced, he would have realised that drawing attention to Galloway and making this great big thing is actually the opposite of what you should be doing. I mean, the other thing that he was saying was that he was talking about Islamophobia and saying that the kind of Muslim vote was being demonised by the main parties, basically. I mean, do you think there's any truth in that? I think la language counts for a lot in politics, and I think people need to. I think people do need to step back and think about some of the language they mm. use. To be totally honest, um, whether it's specifically the case that um, Muslims have been demonised, I don't know. Perhaps for other, for others to say, mm. but I think rhetoric is important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did. I did like Rishi's speech actually, mm. and one of the reasons I liked it, as I think. There, there are debates that need to be had, and in my opinion, some of the lessons that politicians need to learn is sometimes when you don't have debate, you leave it at the fringes. That's my fear. 
mm. that you leave those debates at the fringes and it's had by people at the fringes. And I think long term that's more damaging. And just, um, you do have a lot more experience than me, Ben, but just from what I've seen, certainly since the kind of round the vote leave referendum and beyond, is when mainstream politicians take those debates on and have them in a sensible way bet between Keir and, Rishi, uh, Keir and Rishi, I think you you manage to isolate that. And one of the things that's, you know, we all remember back when the BMP did get a lot of popularity, that was killed off. It's, those things get, I think they get killed off from the centre. Yeah. I, th I think one of the things I did welcome in, in his statement in, in, in Downing Street was he actually did talk about Islamophobia because I think all too often in the past he's talked about anti-Semitism but he hasn't talked about Islamophobia and as we know from last week he had a big problem in his own party with his own former chairman having to resign or have the whip withdrawn uh, because of stuff he said. So I think in, that was a welcome development but I didn't think giving Galloway and drawing attention to all that was a wise thing to do and I didn't really see any reason for it. Okay. Uh, interesting stuff. Thank you both very much indeed. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. Is the Chancellor going to cut public spending this week to pay for tax cuts? And if so, where will the Act fall? We'll be speaking to the head of the teaching union. That's next. We'll be talking a lot on the show tonight about Wednesday's budget, who the Chancellor is trying to impress and how. But really, his central dilemma is this, how do you cut cat taxes and keep your call vote happy while also positioning yourself as the fiscally responsible Chancellor? Because with debt projected to hit record levels, this is not a time when you can find a couple of billion quid down the back of a sofa. One way to fund tax cuts, of course, is to make cuts to public spending. But what would that mean for public services? 
Well, with us now is the General Secretary of the National Education Union, that is Daniel Kabidi. Thank you so much for being with us. So what are you hoping to see in the budget? Well, uh, last year, at the Conservative Party conference, Rishi Sunak said that uh, nothing mattered more than education funding, that education was the silver bullet. We haven't seen any evidence of them investing at all at the moment. We wrote to them uh, multiple times asking for investment to fix the school estate, to fix the SEND crisis, to restore school funding levels to 2010. They had the autumn statement. They haven't changed course. We're really hoping for them to change course this week. I mean, I guess what they would say is that they have given schools extra money, two billion pounds this year and next year. Debt is at historic levels, but they are prioritising education. That's what they would say. Our children wouldn't say that, nor would the, our parents or the teachers in schools currently. We literally have schools crumbling around the heads of children due to this government's neglect of education. We have currently record class sizes due to a huge teacher shortage that has been driven by successive pay cuts and rocketing workloads. Uh, teaching is not an attractive profession. The reality is education at the moment is on the brink. We really do need to see some investment. What kind of things... Are we seeing them in schools? You know, you said that schools are crumbling around. Mm -hmm. what, what, what kind of individual things are you seeing? Well, on mass, we're seeing a million children now taught in class sizes of 31 or more. You know, in the UK, we have class sizes on average seven with seven extra pupils compared to the rest of Europe. I mean. Children with special educational needs are not able to access the CAM support um, or any other SEND services, really. Things are really at crisis point now, and the government need to heed that. If the government choose to spend money on tax cuts this week, they say, look, working people need a bit of extra cash at the end of the day, would you say that's fair enough if public sector services are used to fund it? I think uh, the public are wanting to see investment in public services at the moment. Tax and spend is not as unpopular as uh, this government are making out according to all polling. Uh, people want to see a functioning NHS. They want to, their children to be taught in properly funded schools uh, that are adequately resourced. And I'm interested to know on your take on Labour uh, as well, uh, because, you know, I guess the easiest way to free up some cash now is to cut spending in the years ahead, and that might leave a bit of a trap for a Labour government. It feels as if Keir Summer and Rachel Reeves are very worried about deviating too much from the Conservatives' plan so they can be painted as the party of the magic money tree. Mm -hmm. Do you think we're really looking at much difference between the Labour and the Conservatives when it comes to education? I mean, Labour do need to be much more ambitious. There's plenty of things that we can welcome from a Labour government, Ofsted reform, curriculum and assessment reform, but we do need to see a real uh, plan of action for schools in terms of investment, but also in terms of our wider... Uh, in terms of child poverty, for example, which has rocketed astronomically over the last decade. You know, we need to see an end to things like the two-child benefit cap. We'd like to see things like a rollout of universal free school meals. It's time, actually, that we had a government that viewed children as an investment, an investment in the future rather than an economic burden. It's interesting you say you'd like to see more ambition from Labour. I feel like I know what your view is of Rishi Sunak, forgive me. But um, what do you say about Keir Starmer? What's your view on him? I am... Um, like many people, uh, hoping for a change in government. Now, Keir Starmer has not given too much away, but I actually believe that he does need to start giving people some hope, um, because at the moment, uh, it doesn't feel like um, there is much hope in society. Um, earlier on the programme, we spoke to James Daly, uh, who is one of the uh, Conservative Party deputy chairmen. Uh, and I said that you were on, so I wanted to kind of bring on some comments that he'd made uh, in an interview with the Iron newspaper. He said this, he said, most of the kids who struggle in Barry are the products of crap parents. And so what do we do to try and address that issue? On the left, it would just be, we'll throw money at this and hope something sticks. But someone like me thinks about this more fundamentally. Do you think he's got a point? I've taught in the northeast of England and in central London. Um, I have never met a parent that does not have aspiration for their child. What I have come across often is parents without the tools to meet those aspirations. There has been, you know, a lack of decent housing, um, you know, uh, resource poverty. This is what drives um, the problems in society, not individualised parents. OK, uh, notice how you dodged the word there. Mm -hmm. uh, very nicely done. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel Kavidi, uh, there of the National Education Union. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. With the news that the Russians intercepted a recording of German military top brass discussing Ukraine, 
We're talking leaks, and whether it's a former president storing sensitive documents in the toilet or a screenshot of a conservative WhatsApp group sent to our very own Sam Coates, the question is, cock up or conspiracy? After the break, we'll let you be the judge. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8 o'clock, we need proper answers, not quick ones. A message for the government from the parents of Nottingham attack victim Grace O'Malley Kumar. I'll be speaking to them after they took their calls for a public inquiry to Westminster. And also, the father of Mia Janin, who took her own life after she was bullied by classmates on social media, will be here in the studio to explain why a ban on smartphones in schools isn't the answer. That's the UK Tonight at 8. So we've got some of the most amazing British classic dishes which we were doing at the Oscars. So we've got a beautiful lobster fish and chips, a bit of tartar sauce, and we've even put the classic British ah, fork, fantastic. which the Americans love, Yeah. Naturally. So this is all food for the after party? Yes, yeah, so the governor's ball. So they go to the, the actual Oscars, they get their award, and they go up the stairs to the governor's ball, which they'll get these dishes. OK. We've also got the prawn cocktail roll, which is served in a soft brioche, sort of three-biter. A little bit of caviar yeah. for the Oscars. Yeah. So, last of all, we've got the amazing Wagyu roasted Yorkshire pudding, roast beef, creamed horseradish and watercress, and it is absolutely amazing. So, hopefully they like it. Oh, I'm sure they will. How yeah. do you decide on the menus? Oh, which one should I try first? Can I try Oh, you can try one, yeah. Probably the prawn cocktail roll yeah. to start. Yeah, amazing. There you go. Thank you. I'm going to have... Do you want some? <laughs> go for it, yeah. yeah. Do you want a prawn? Yeah, go on then. I'll have a prawn then for you. There you go. So it's a little bit of Mary Rose sauce. OK. Keeping it as classic Not as possible. Prom. Thanks. Hopefully they love it, but yeah. let's see. So, yeah. but, I mean, they've got the fancy frocks on and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, everything had to be taken into consideration. Notice I said the caviar for me. Oh, yeah, the big <laughs> piece, yeah, well, why not? Why not? And how many, how many covers are you doing? Like, what's it's, the scale of this? It oh, is yeah. actually enormous. It's around 2,000 people. And you, there's, like, a huge, yeah. huge queue. And I'm looking, I'm like, surely that's not the queue for this store. Because there's, like... 10 stands within this governor's ball, it's like ballroom, um, and there's just queues and queues of people. But we were quite popular because yeah. we were doing the British food, and the Americans love fish and chips and all that kind of thing. So it was super, super, super popular. Um, couldn't mm. keep up, obviously, but you know, carried on, carried on. There's only three chefs on that front desk, so. Which big names made it to your stall? That's yeah, yeah that's great so question. Wow, well, there were so many amazing people, and I mean, for me. Brendan Fraser, obviously, he had won the Oscar oh, yeah. last year, and he was so lovely. Lady Gaga was oh! amazing. This is wagyu, the wagyu, isn't it? Yeah, this is, is this the wagyu beef. Yeah, okay. and we roast the Yorkshire pudding in a little bit of wagyu fat, so it gives it that sort of shine and crunch. It's a lot more sort of luxurious than normal. Right, but it's delicious. And do they come back for more? Do you have to yeah. say you've already had yours? They do, and some people will be asking, "Can I have extra beef?" and being cheeky, but mm. that's all good. Hello and welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now to a news story that sounds like something out of a spy novel. Russia has intercepted a discussion among the German military about operations in Ukraine. Now, the Russians managed to access a chat which was hosted on the WebEx conference platform rather than a secure army platform. And in the 38 minute call, the German Air Force chief discussed some possible supplies of Taurus missiles. So pretty serious breach, pretty embarrassing for the Germans. Why have the conversation on WebEx? So we thought we would remind you of some other occasions the powers that be perhaps weren't as careful as they should have been. Back in 2000, there was a fury when it was revealed an MI6 officer mislaid a laptop containing classified material after drinking at a tapas bar in central London. A few years ago, more classified defence documents which went missing were discovered by a member of the public in a reportedly soggy heap behind a bus stop in Kent. And just last year, official documents about a hunter-killer Royal Navy submarine were reportedly discovered in the loos of a Weatherspoons in Cumbria. Extraordinary. <laughs> Let's bring in Ben and James, shall we? Extraordinary stuff. I mean, you were just saying, weren't you, earlier, about how genuinely serious this story could actually be. The German one is really yeah. serious. I mean, these all sound like innocent mistakes that, that uh, from memory, I don't think any particular harm came from, but the German one, A, it was a Russian intercept. Yeah. And the Germans should not have been speaking on such an open platform, that's and that's worrying itself. Yeah. 
uh, and it will seriously damage trust, uh, particularly among the Five Eyes allies in Germany. But it also reveals division within the German government on the whole issue of Ukraine and the unwillingness so far of, of Germany to provide these tourist missiles with the foreign minister today coming out and flatly contradicting Chancellor mm. Scholz. Very worrying. Germany is the strongest economy in Europe, the second biggest supporter of Ukraine, and Ukraine really needs all the help it can get at yeah, the moment. It's extraordinary. And it's, it's, it, I, I do worry about what, what, what it augurs for the next few weeks and months. Mm. Have you ever um, left any government documents in a Weatherspoons pub? Not to my recollection. Um, and I'll certainly <laughs> deny it if anyone, that, if anyone yeah. puts that to me yeah. in any leak, leak inquiry. I mean, we, we were kind of talking as well about leaks. I mean, yeah, they're, they're part and parcel of government. A lot of these things are kind of, I mean, not to defend it, but we probably all left something on a train at once. And I left government papers on a train, and uh, Did you? fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I had good relationships with the guards who worked for Great, Great Western, <laughs> and somebody met it at Plymouth and got it back to me. Oh, that's themselves. so nice. That is nice, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's a really nice thing. Uh, yeah, there, I remember there was a photographer. I spent a lot of time uh, standing outside Downing Street in the kind mm. of cold, and there was a photographer who literally, his whole business was just taking pictures of papers, zooming in, and it's extraordinary. so much stuff you managed to find out over the years. That's, That's the classic, point. as someone's going into Downing Street to remind them, don't have your papers showing, because yeah. you'll definitely end up on, a, I think yeah. it's political picks. Or whatever. And some leaking is good, right? Because it's part of a healthy democracy, isn't it? Well, I, I, we were chatting earlier about this, and I think, I think that leaking is a symptom of the functionality of government. If the mm. government's functioning well and is united, and people aren't jostling, jostling for position for a potential leadership election <laughs> after an election, then there tends to be less leaking. I think in the current circumstances, there's quite a lot because various candidates are jostling for position yeah. post-election. Yeah, it certainly was. One thing I would say is that I think when I went into government, you have this view when you become as a special advisor that you think it's all going to come... Your, your attacks are going to come from the Labour Party. Not true. <laughs> <coughs> the, 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 most, the stuff that you deal with most in a department is stuff that's coming from other departments because you're having a policy debate that your boss wants to do or doesn't want to do, the Treasury or some other department or for or against it, and the calls you get from the lobby, the press, mm. are often something that has definitely not come from the Labour Party because mm. it's come from another government department. And that was the thing that surprised me most. Mm. I'm not... A, accusing anyone directly, but I would suggest that's a lot of what goes on. Yeah, and it's more interesting, isn't it, for us naughty hacks, if it's uh, some friendly fire from Conservative MP rather than the Labour uh, Party, which you'd expect to disagree uh, anyway. Um, thanks very much uh, for being uh, on a very lively uh, programme tonight, James Starkey, Ben Bradshaw. Thank you for your time. That's it from us tonight. I'll see you tomorrow night at 7pm. Up next, it's the UK Tonight with Sarah Jane Mee. Uh, see you tomorrow. We'll have lots more... Budget previews, I'm sure. <laughs>